<laughs> Absolutely. So yes, anything in life has ups and downs because I, I want so many more PhD students to hear my story and hear how this whole line of career is actually not only viable but also better <laughs> but it's so subjective so take what i'm saying with a grain of salt because this is my personal journey basically um hello and welcome everyone to who's ever listening to this particular podcast on youtube apple google spotify or any other platforms I'm Jay Shah and I invite machine learning engineers, researchers, entrepreneurs to talk more about their current work, insights about their journey and getting started with it. And for this particular podcast we have Nasreen Mustafa Zadeh who is the co-founder of a deep tech startup Wernick and has been in the space of AI startups for the past 5 years now. Before that she was a research senior research scientist at Elemental Cognition and Benevolent AI and prior to which she graduated with a PhD degree from University of Rochester Her major research interests are in building intelligent systems that can demonstrate common sense reasoning and generate causal explanations in order to improve human AI collaborations She was also featured in the Forbes 30 under 30 list for her work in natural language understanding We'll be talking to her today about her background and story into getting into AI, some details of her research work and insights about getting uh, started and exploring the AI startup space. So, uh, Nasreen, welcome to the podcast and thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Jay. Glad to be here. So, uh, to learn more about your background and your um, interests, can you tell to us more about your personal story into interest into AI? Um, how did you get started with it? Absolutely. So that is a bit of a long story, though. I don't know how 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 deep you want me to go. So um, I just you know back in time, um, I was always into computers, just as a toy, basically. Um, so this is like back in maybe elementary school. I just loved spending time with computers, doing anything I could learn how to, right? And just. like later on maybe in middle school i realized that there is this thing called programming which is much better than doing like 3d designs and all the other like like and building animations and such a things that i thought are a good thing to do with computers so that completely changed my mind as to the possibilities of what you can do through this device that is in front of you um and i always wanted to do something um but with robots somehow i knew that oh this machine can write programs that can then automate like the lights and limbs of another you know little tiny thing um so like fast forward in high school uh, i got uh, basically introduced to these um uh, particular competitions called robocop competitions which were you know which are these annual like just like soccer like world cup or these annual games that uh basically different kinds of teams from all over the world compete in a particular league which is not which is like a soccer but could be simulated could be like rescue simulation which is a simulated basically um rescue environment so anyways i i just always wanted to do something in robotic uh, robotics as i mentioned so i got into rescue simulation and with a bunch of really great friends of mine uh we got together and basically had a team in the it just went beyond our you know wildest dreams we could go to the international games in in uh, germany and we got second blah blah so it was all really amazing but that's that's when i started basically working in ai uh back in time um but the interesting thing that happened which is so funny when i think back, back about it and the way i got into nlp was that due to competing in these games of course we wouldn't go to our normal classes Oh, and I have to mention that. So I grew up in Iran. This is our high school in Iran, which again, the free education, amazing free education that we had access to, was enabling us to do all these things basically in a, our normal education. Um, so, anyways, we uh, due to uh, needing to work on our own, like say, AI models for building these like risky simulation uh, models, um, we couldn't go to our normal classes. One of which was our physical like physical ed education i guess we call it and the teacher that we had for that course told me that i would not pass you unless you like she handed me this big like um you know like many like documents unless you translate all of these like english documents to persian and so at the time i had like maybe two weeks or so 
and I'm like sitting, I'm like, oh my God, how on earth would I be able to pass this course by translating <laughs> these documents in two weeks? And uh, like at a time, I was just thinking to myself that I spend my entire li like life in front of computers. Shouldn't there be a way of automating this? And I have an ad, blah, blah. And so I kid you not, by that day, I did not know that the field national language processing existed on the face of the universe. And I had no idea what a machine translation is. So I just literally Googled like how to trans automatically translate, of course, like English to Persian. And that just, you know, one thing led to another. I basically came across national language processing and all the subfields of it, like being machine translation, text some musician, et cetera. And so anyways, through that adventure of like kind of the thinking beyond like what I was already doing with, with uh, AI, I realized that there's this entire other subfield of AI, which uh, is actually even more challenging. So it's so interesting that uh, although you could Google, there was Wikipedia and everything, I had this physical encyclopedia uh, that you could look things up in. And I remember I looked up national language processing and maybe the national language understanding. And there was this um, a motivating example that I still to this day open all of my talks with which is this uh, basically an affordable resolution problem that the basically um, encyclopedia was saying that natural language understanding is the, one of the hardest sub problems of AI and was like exactly explicitly saying that although it's one of the easiest things for us as humans, even like a four-year-old is so, um, you know, just it's just comes so naturally to a four-year-old to speak in our own language is one of the hardest things for, for the machines. And the reason for that being was explained through this motivating example. So the sentence is that uh, ben, the, ben, uh, basically when he ate the banana because it was hungry. So the it pronoun, the question is, does it refer back to the banana or the monkey? And of course, as human beings, right, we all know that it being hungry has to refer back to the monkey, not the banana. Whereas if it was like, it was right, you know that the pronoun gets flipped. Uh, we nowadays know this as the Vinograd like, schema challenge. Um, but back in time, it was just saying that because of the fact that we need all this vast amount of background knowledge and common sense knowledge to basically connect the dots and infer and reason that the, it actually is referring back to the uh, monkey, not the banana, it's, it's an AI complete problem. So that did completely change my mind, right? That completely changed my world. I basically felt like, my goodness, I wasted my time working in robotics for like two years of my life. I was in my life for so long that uh, like I have to switch. And that was the pivotal moment that I truly switched to national language understanding. And kind of boringly, I've been working on the similar problem, if not the exact same problem ever since. And you know, that's like the rest is history, right? So I did the exact same thing in undergrad. Uh, my undergrad thesis was on temporal text summarization. So how do you go about uh, doing text summarization from the lens of events and their temporal relations? Because that's a signal as to the prevalency. And then I joined, um, you know, when I uh, joined IRS at Rochester was to work with James Allen, who's a pioneer in temporal um, understanding of national language and events and causality and common sense. And so, yeah, I've been doing pretty much the exact same thing since then. Yeah, definitely. This is one of the most interesting stories, like uh, your interest in into NLP and in, ge in general, like uh, getting to have a punishment where you uh, mm -hmm. got a motivation to get interested into NLP was something really really interesting and yeah I, I definitely understand the uh, the interest in NLU and just trying to understand of how we reason things uh, how and how to incorporate those uh, knowledge into machines to reason yeah, almost good as humans is definitely something very um, highly researched and discussed about so uh, talking more about that uh, on that particular tangent uh, much of your recent uh, recent work as you said uh, has been revolving around intelligent systems that can reason better and reason with causation in, in, in itself how we oh, humans normally I'm reason so sorry, uh, one of your recent oh, they're, <laughs> they're just blowing <laughs> here oh yeah <laughs> Okay, but uh, can you hear me fine or I, I can should I, hear should I pause? as long as you don't mind the noise I'm fine yes I, I, yeah it's 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 uh, not that uh, severe on my end so I think oh, I should okay, be good. Good enough. 
but uh, yeah as we were talking about like uh, most of your recent work has been along those interests that you mentioned along the, along the line of natural language understanding mm -hmm. which is uh, trying to build systems that can reason with causation and along those lines your work has been glucose which you named it very very nicely which it definitely feels nice when we see it other models were named very weirdly so thanks for doing that and that work uh, uh, that work has been along those lines of trying to understand and incorporate common sense into machines. So can you talk more about your intuition? Like uh, I, I, I had a chance to look at the paper. It's fantastic. And it, it deals with developing a data set which has 10 dimensions of incorporating these uh, very basic common sense features into the model itself and let it train accordingly. So can you talk more about your intuition for doing that? And what are the what were the end goals and how did you achieve that? So that's actually a very good question. And I really appreciate um, in general being asked about the intentions and uh, motivations and uh, basically rationale behind any line of research. I think that's something that not everyone does and it definitely helps us pick and choose more important problems. Uh, so I can just maybe zoom back a little bit and talk about um, uh, how basically my line of research got uh, culminated in uh, the glucose work, which is the more recent uh, work of mine. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, so the motivating example that I actually gave you about the basically example that got me into common sense reasoning and natural language understanding in general, believe it or not, it's still to this day um, is a problem that is not necessarily solved. So core NLP, stand for core NLP being the state-of-the-art um, core reference resolution system that uh, is being used still to this day gets that n for resolution problem wrong. So it actually resolves it to uh, basically the banana, not the monkey, uh, which is fascinating, right? I, I, I think this is something that uh, is kind of mind-boggling that we've made all this amazing progress in AI and you would think so many of these things are solved. But the truth is that uh, whenever you have a problem in front of you that requires all this vast background knowledge and common sense, basically, and reasoning, it, it's just still tough. Um, so anyways, um, just moving forward, one of the things that has uh, been really interesting to me is to watch all these cognitive capabilities that it, they basically kids have like a three-year-old, four-year-old, but it still is extremely hard for, for the machines, the AI systems, basically. Uh, one such uh, cap cognitive capability being that as human beings, uh, even as, as I said, like two, three, four-year-old kids, when we read a piece of text or we hear a story, whatever it is, or we are even situated in a particular environment, we make all these inference, uh, basically implicit inferences uh, about uh, what it is that has happened, right? What, what happened? Why did it happen? Uh, like uh, where there are things, right? And all these different attributes that we associate with our uh, basically uh, instincts and assumptions uh, as to how, how this situation has come about being and what could come after it is. So this capability of ours for constructing such like coherent mental models of whatever situation that we are grounded in, which, um, you know, for me, the, my point of interest is on narrative text, is it, just something that is to this date something that um, for AI systems is, is just really hard. Um, so the one uh, such story that I always uh, use as an example is this very simple Peppa Pig story. So it's like a five sentence story from Rock Stories, which is a, a prior work of mine. So the story, simple story goes as follows, that Peppa Pig was riding her bike, a car turned in front of her, Peppa turned her bike sharply, she fell off her bike and Peppa skinned her knee. So this very simple five sentence story, ex what we read explicitly is just a drop in an ocean, right? As in terms of all the other inferences and deductions that we make as human beings when we read that. For example, we very automatically and easily construct this coherent causal chain of uh, that explains like how the car, like let's say unexpectedly turned uh, in front of her and how that ultimately led to her falling. We know about all these, like the roller coaster of emotion that, uh, for example, Peppa Pig probably was experiencing. Probably she was fine at, you know, front, like heavily driving, right, basically riding her bike. And then after she falls, she's probably in pain and agony. And 
it's likely that she may even after that like shout for help or something which is a natural thing that we do as human beings so although we all uh, as human beings build such as i was saying mental models just super easily it's been really hard for ai systems uh to 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 do so and exhibit any you know such common sense uh, readabilities basically and the motivation for the glucose work came uh, from basically diagnosing um, two major bottlenecks that have existed in the community basically in the AI research community for why we are not there yet uh, one is that uh, you know I, the way I put it is that we've had difficulty in acquiring such often implicit common sense pieces of knowledge at scale and the second being that we've had difficulty in incorporating such knowledge, even if we could acquire it at a scale into the AI, you know, state of the art AI systems, which are very much uh, capable of, right, of like pattern recognition, perceptual uh, tasks, et cetera, which, you know, would hold us back if we can't basically leverage and stand on top of their shoulders, basically. Um, so that's like how we basically, that was the, the motivation, right? We, want to, we wanted to finally make a tiny, tiny step forward in giving AI systems such, you know, fundamental human capability of building such coherent causal models of what theory. Um, so we, you know, for, through that, um, I basically, through with my uh, awesome colleagues at Elemental Cognition, we worked on uh, building this glucose uh, data set. And one, uh, you know, just uh, like going, uh, just opening a side window I want to make is that uh, we have, which we can probably work, talk about later on as well, uh, we've made a ton of progress in natural language understanding and common sense reasoning in the past couple of years. Um, and part parts of it being my own work that like we've had other you know evaluation benchmarks that ha have been beaten. What, what what does that mean for for common sense reasoning for AI etc. Uh, but the the truth is that we need to move uh, the uh, benchmark basically. We need to move uh, you know basically set ourselves up for harder task. And one of the reasons I wanted to do glucose was that I wanted always to work on a task that is harder for in terms of common sense reasoning. So prior to that, I had worked on a story close test, which basically had to deal with choosing the right ending to the story. Uh, so a story close test went as follows, basically given the very much the same Peppa Pig story that I told you, let's say that we removed the fifth sentence, which was that uh, Peppa basically skinned her knee. And then now the task becomes, okay, predict what's the right ending to the story. In order to make it evaluable, we had made it a, a classification task where you know, the system had to choose the right ending. But again, the choosing the right ending among two options is an easy task, right? Even when we accomplish that, we have to just keep basically moving the milestone for ourselves and you know uh, basically bec become more and more ambitious as to how far we can go so glucose was always for me an attempt towards not only just basically generating even or picking the ending to the story but also explaining why why do you do this why do you think this is the next thing that happens so anyways that led us to glucose uh, and the which stands for generalized and contextualized story explanation this is a you know, 2020 work that we had at EMNLP. Um, so basically, uh, glucose goes as follows. Given a short story, which we call S, and a selected sentence X inside that story, uh, we want to capture 10 dimensions of causal explanations that are related to X. And we, you know, had lots and lots of studies, even our team, we had a, someone with a cognitive psychology background uh, to help us pick what are dimensions of understanding and explanation that one should capture. And of course, it had to be more practical through the fact that we wanted this, as I said, the bottleneck, one of the first bottlenecks was that you couldn't collect common sense knowledge at a scale. So we wanted to address that. So it had to be kinds of things that just proud workers hopefully would be able to understand. Uh, so we, after many, many rounds of uh, you know, pilot studies and back and forth, we came up with 10 dimensions of causality. So we started with like 18 or so and we boiled it down to 10. Um, so these dimensions are basically capturing often implicit causes and effects for that sentence X, which is basically the selected sentence. And these will like basically capture various things all the way from events to locations, possessions, and other attributes, uh, basically in relevancy to X. Um, the 
more uh, basically prominent feature, or the most prominent uh, basically feature of glucose is that it encodes the common sense knowledge and these explanations in the form of semi-structured inference rules, which I've been calling mini theories about the world, uh, which are also grounded in a specific story. Uh, so we can just go through one example so that it becomes clear to the audience what that means. For example, for the Peppa story, let's say, so the story S is that Peppa story that I already shared. The sentence X, uh, let's say, is the Peppa turned her bike sharply. The dimension number one in glucose basically asks this basic question. Is there an event that directly causes X to happen? And X is Peppa turned her bike sharply. And of course, if we want to answer that question, uh, in a specific way, meaning in terms of what exactly we see has happened in the story, we can say that, oh, so a car turned in front of uh, Peppa, that's what causes Peppa to turn her bike. But what is so unique about glucose is that we are actually interested in capturing the general mini theories about the world, which then are contextualized through specific statements, which is the first thing that I said that a car turned in front of her. So the general mini theory about the world that we can basically apply here is something like this. So we say um, something A turns in front of something B that is someone A's vehicle of whatever shape or form it takes basically can cause or enable someone A turns in front of, turns something B basically away from something A. It sounds a little bit complex, but as you see, this is about uh, just basically giving some working knowledge, right? That is general enough that wouldn't just apply to this one particular story, but is actually pretty broad. Um, so anyways, one quick thing I think is worth mentioning uh, is that the reason we chose to uh, basically have two different ways of encoding knowledge, one being specific statement, which is exactly applicable to the story and one general uh, inference rule, is that generalization, as your audience may know, has been one of the major shortcomings of the you know, recent like, neural models, basically. And our models are extremely data hungry. Whatever they learn, they learn by having seen lots and lots of data, but their generalization out of the scope of what they're being trained on has always been an issue. So this is our attempt, basically, to think about the fact that what if we give the systems a leg up and actually explicitly tell them the mini theories that then they should ground, which can make our basically models ultimately much more data efficient. The other thing is that, you know, we did lots and lots of studies, as I said, um, to basically figure out what is even an explanation, right? The, our initial pilots had no semi-structured inference rule as the template that people are gonna fill in. It was free form, right? Then we let people basically lose to tell us what, it, like, how would you explain what happened to Peppa? Why did it happen to her? What happens next? People would write anything and everything, basically. But when you dig deeper, um, turns out, uh, like, there are, like, studies in, like, psychology and cognitive psychology uh, showing that, actually, as human beings, also, our explanations are very much dependent on the generalized semantic abstractions that we build off of our episodic memories that we've collected throughout our lifetime. And then, you know, you go and basically search and then apply this. And of course, all of these take a fraction of like millisecond probably for, for our, you know, brains to do that. But that's basically, as much as I hate to like cite like things from like neuroscience and cognitive science, because a lot of our um, AI work in general in the community is really like void of that and there's so many unknowns about how the brain works but you know there, there are different theories about like different parts of the brain that are actually responsible for like collecting basically episodic memory and encoding episodic memory that then different parts of the brain basically is responsible for making the abstractions and generalization which is what you know basically in a sense um we we, we are you know remotely trying to uh, capture here um, so anyways, just long story short, I tell lots of stories, working on stories as well. Long story short, um, with uh, glucose, we ended up basically uh, defining this framework that was intuitive enough uh, that we could crowdsource it. So we ended up crowdsourcing uh, like 600, like I think 70,000 or so of these specific statements and um, along with their uh, counterpart, which is a general inference rule. 
And um, yeah, so there are just so many other, of course, details like about the models that we built, the kind of data that we collected, but that's basically the motivation. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, one of the key things, like like, like you said, uh, one of the reasons you hate uh, um, citing it back to cognitive psychology, I found it to be the most interesting thing because it, it mm -hmm. saves you from the part that when people say it's the inmates who are running the asylum, right? So you're trying to mm -hmm. cite back and making machine much more incorporative of um, the way humans reason. So I think... Uh, uh, I think that is uh, that is a nice uh, touch to glucose, and I think that's what makes it more intuitive mm -hmm. and uh, interesting. But a question here would be: uh, Do you think that the kind of like you you narrowed down your dimensions from eighteen to ten or on certain basis, and was it specific to the data set that you were dealing with? Or like, is it is it something that could be scalable when we say, uh, like you said, it, it's a drop in the ocean, right? So when I'm trying to deal with uh, glucose on a different data set, should I be uh, cognizant about the fact that uh, it only captures 10 dimensions? And if I'm if I'm kind of using some kind of other data set, I should be I should be um, collecting and making my data set curated accordingly so that it it captures more dimensions. Absolutely. So any, and that's a good question. So many people ask me that. Uh, the, the truth is that any data set, any uh, test set, basically any evaluation benchmark inherently is narrow and glucose being one of those, right? So it would be really kind of stupid of me or anyone to claim that whatever they have built is not narrow. Uh, this is what we could accomplish by uh, like by having had the constraint of it being something that anyone and everyone can do, right? As you can imagine, these inference rules, which are semi-structured, so there's an antecedent, a connective, and a consequent, uh, and then these syntactic slots that people have to fill, it's a pretty challenging task, right? And that kind of limited our uh, scope as to the kinds of things that would be intuitive to uh, basically workers out there. Uh, for example, the distinction between cause and enable, I had like a prior work in which we just defined what it is that we mean by causality, was distinction between uh, cause, enable, like prevention, like these whole first dynamic view into the world and, and in conjunction with events. Um, none of that is in Kugos, right? It just did not make sense. We could not, the workers could not handle or think basically about the distinction between cause and enable and that set aside even for ourselves as the researchers on the other end uh, even we would argue over what is enable what's cause so we ended up basically collapsing those and like so hence like basically we have not causes slash enable so there are so many different shortcomings right uh, as to what glucose captures and at the end of the day although we've tried our best to be as holistic as possible right we've tried to make sure that we uh, cover so many inferential pieces of knowledge that none of the prior work would, um, you know, basically handle things like not only we're covering like event to event, like relations as to what caused what, uh, but also states. So like uh, possession, right. Or like uh, emotion, um, like just talking about position, for example, just a very basic common sense piece of knowledge uh, such as I, um, so when I hand you something, then you possess that thing. This is such a basic, implicit, uh, you know, common sense knowledge that we all share, and you can't find it anywhere written online, right? These are all implicit. These are so basic that no one reports. It's called reporting bias problem in AI. Uh, so by having explicitly collected that from workers, we are basically uh, making it so that the AI system may ultimately know about these things. Um, so anyways, those are the kinds of things that we have collected. So like possession, as I mentioned, like emotion, et cetera. But there's so many different things that we haven't captured, right? It is a drop in the ocean, for sure. And the other very important comment I want to make is that common sense knowledge is multimodal, right? I've personally, like back in time, a couple of years ago, I've worked on a lot of visual language problems in, for common sense reasoning. And the truth is that, what is it, like they say 70 up to 90 something percent of our communication is nonverbal, right, as human being. So it's obvious that natural language, just by the, the virtue that glucose is capturing common sense knowledge in a textual form, it's limited. So there's so far that you can go. And yes, um, I think for any resource, including glucose, you have to uh, make sure that you understand what it captures and what doesn't. But at least to 
the degree that I'm aware compared to anything else that is out there, glucose has the widest um, basically coverage in terms of the different phenomena, like different kind of causal, causal information that it captures. Right, right. So, uh, like, like you said, uh, it's it's clearly transparent that glucose does and learns these facts. And uh, you, when we talk about causal explanations, which is which somewhat ties us to the idea of explainability, right? So you want the models so that you can at least try to question why did you do that in the past versus what will you do in the future, so that gives you a dimension of uh, understanding mm -hmm. what the model is trying to learn. And uh, one of the few uh, few keywords uh, that are really popular in NLP are. Uh, attention-based models right mm, yes. attention-based models have itself got a lot of attention uh, in the past mm. few years so what do you think about like m when um, most of the people who try to build these models they say attention can be used as a way of learning the feature importances from these models so that can explain you what the model is doing but uh, I mean if, if I were to map this to a computer vision uh, domain because I, I, I kind of work on those similar lines we definitely know that attention maps are not the clearest way of attention that is just mm -hmm. uh, that is just trying to uh, do these things at a many uh, much of a I would say surface level, but uh, like you said, it's it's much more multimodal. We have to understand the causal relations. So, can you try to compare and maybe comment on those two tools? Like, what are, are there any advantages of using attention when we are dealing with explanations versus what would be the pitfalls of um, methods that you are pursuing versus uh, mm -hmm. uh, benefits of those? Good question. So. It's kind of interesting. My personal journey into working on explanation has not been due to, you know, all this new surge of um, basically needing accountability and interpretability for AI models and like basically uh, the kind of things like regulations, right? Uh, it, it has come from my personal uh, just fascination by cognitive ability of us as human beings to to explain things to ask why right like children just grow up asking why about anything and everything they actually annoyingly right they keep asking why 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 so and that of course i've been looking into explanation from the lens of common sense reasoning because common sense reasoning has a lot to do with causality and with like explaining basically things that happen and how and why basically the whole dynamics of the of our world basically um so i just wanted to share that to give a give an intro into my personal take on explanation which can sort of give away the the comment I want to make that, of course, for me, working on common sense reasoning and like wanting to capture implicit kind of stuff, like so in NLP, let's say, right? In NLP, when people want to use attention as uh, explanation, what they do is that, let's say, I'm working on a squat task, which is this reading comprehension task. You read a passage, there is a question. Now, in order to answer the question, uh, you want to highlight bits and pieces of the text that are actually you're attending so that that's how you're coming up with the answer. As okay as that sounds, I personally care about the problems that don't have anything explicit in the text for you to highlight. So what do you do then, right? So that's like by inherently so narrow in, in terms of uh, if we want to define explanation with attention maps that's just super narrow, right? But let's say even that's okay. Let's say I don't work on common sisters any, I don't care about implicit knowledge and uh, all we care about is to highlight uh, bits and pieces of text, for example, to showcase why I came up with an answer to a particular question. Um, so that has been, actually it's good that, uh, to be honest with you, that attention existed in the first place so that we had a proxy. Uh, I don't know if uh, you've seen, like, maybe in 2019 or so, there was this whole, uh, basically, sequence of papers in an LP community that were questioning whether or not attention is explanation. I actually think that the, even the title of the first paper was from Northeastern was Attention is Not Explanation. Uh, so luckily, a bunch of people did some theoretical, like, grounded work to, to show that, well, it turns out there's not much correlation between the input and output. And, you know, there was another, like, a kind of a sequel, <laughs> like a paper that was saying attention is not not explanation. So anyways, there's a <laughs> lot of uh, kind of argument, there's just a lot of back and forth onto uh, what attention maps do and don't. Uh, my net of it is that... Um, it's a good proxy. It's good to always have proxy, but it's so limiting. 
let's first and foremost, let's not call it explanation. There's a subtle difference between interpretability and explainability. And I think if we, you know, basically uh, just give ourselves a leg up by calling something as simple as attention maps explanation, we won't make enough progress in, in the area in general. Right, right. So, um, like, like you said, the la the last point. I want to extend that a little bit. And I, I know this is not the forte of your research interest, but if you were to just reflect back as a researcher, are we are we using these terms very interchangeably? What do you what do we mean by mm -hmm. interpretability? And in, in, in any uh, trajectory of research, when we say we want to build interpretable AI models versus explainable AI models, and from a researcher's perspective, what is the what is the difference? What should be the end goal? What are the metrics that one should define a model? In the past, we have known that when we say better models, that means they have some kind of accuracy or some kind of end goal that is to be optimized. And if they beat those uh, leaderboards or some kind of metrics, we say they are better models. But uh, how do we how do we define and how do you understand personally uh, what would be your uh, requirement for calling an AI model ex interpretable versus explainable? Wow, that's quite a question, right? And I am not the right, like, as you mentioned, I don't work on uh, like interpretability myself. So there's so many people better than me who have done fundamental work to answer that question. But my personal take on it is that, um, so you mentioned like interpretability versus explainability. There's a subtle difference, right? I think even just in commonsensically, if you ask people, like what is the difference between these two words when you apply it in everyday world, explanation is more outward facing and interpretation is more inward facing. So if I'm making a decision myself, like as mastery, and I know that, oh, this is why I said that, although the person in front of me may not know. So, but when I'm explaining, it can be kind of explaining away, right? It's a way mm -hmm. of communicating my line of thinking or my line of decision-making so that people can understand and like reflect back, et cetera. So then that's the thing, right? So I think which is why I was saying that attention maps should be at best called interpretation, not explanation, uh, if we care about the distinction. But again, explanation is such an overloaded term these days, like not just these days, well, since pa past five years ago, right? Uh, people have been using it uh, to refer to so many different things. Even I think in our glucose paper, um, yeah, my goodness, in our glucose paper, we have a footnote saying that in this paper, we refer to inference rules as explanations. So even in the scope of our work, when I talk about explanation, I'm talking about like chaining a bunch of inference rules together and that's an explanation. So um, as to what really constitutes a model that is explainable, that's such a fundamental question, right? I personally, to, through having worked in lots of actual real world like AI applications, I know that um, it's been long overdue for us to think about the fact that our systems are going to have some critical use cases that are going to uh, need to be sort of verified and vetted and like explained. Um, so I, I think this whole you know conversation is extremely healthy and I think it can become very domain specific what constitutes an acceptable level of uh, transparency and clarity and like uh, basically interpretability. Like for example, like I, uh, I've worked on using the same kind of stuff that I'm working on basically in national language understanding and machine reading, but apply it for drug discovery. So how do you go about like reading many, many papers and like lots and lots of different like new findings and connect the dots and try to infer like, okay, like what are the biomechanical uh, basically systems that can whatever be efficacious for this or that. Um, so there, like I know what constitutes enough explanation for even a particular uh, drug discovery scientist versus another is different, like, because they have to do different, like uh, their end goal, some people put, you know, that have to do the uh, like in vitro tests, some people have to do in vivo tests, like it's just really different, depends on the application. But as, as I said, I think, these kind of conversations have been long overdue. I don't think there is a any like a silver bullet as to what constitutes true, you know, finally like transparent model. We all have to care about it. Uh, I wish we had cared about it like ten years ago, eight years ago. But you know, good that we are now all talking about it. 
yeah yeah i i really like your conclusion because that's what i have been reading and mm-hmm. that is the that is the kind of uh, uh, as of now the state of our research for interpretability that there, there is not one one solution that fits all so you have to be really uh, application specific and you have to define like you said in the glucose paper you had a, you had a definition of that our inference rules are explanations mm-hmm. and if you if you achieve that then you can say our models are explainable so yeah that, i'll definitely uh, agree to that point mm-hmm. and um before before we go out of your research domain i just have one other opinion question that maybe um, i think you might have expected was understanding of the performances for gpt models <laughs> so uh, in, in the past few years <laughs> in the past few years we have seen this uh, hype and i don't know if it's still there but uh, definitely few of the people who are still discovering mm-hmm. there has always been a hype around gpt models and mm-hmm. being the gpt 1 2 or 3 uh, they have out at least in the media attention they have got a lot of attention for understanding what gpt models can do but quickly when uh, if we look at from a researcher's perspective we see where the model can easily fail despite the fact that it's such a huge model and we expect it to perform so much better so what do you think from a research standpoint uh, are like in, in terms of language generation can the improvements to gpt models could be a way forward or still we do we have to have a room for thinking outside the box that gpt the inherent uh, recipe for gpt models are not enough are they not capturing enough because if we see 175 billion parameter model we expect it to outperform everything and anything that we uh, wanted so what is your opinion or take on that a uh, good question so i want to answer that in two points so first and foremost uh in terms of basically how far a model like gpt3 can go and then second uh whether or not we should think beyond gpt3 so just to answer the latter first look i think this is a generic answer to any such research question we should always think out of the box we should always try to avoid the mainstream right like if if anything the 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 this kind of success that we are seeing in ai through the whatever dawn of deep learning since like 8 years ago has been through the fact that a bunch of really amazing people did not give up on what they believed in and they actually pushed against the mainstream and did their own thing and look what we have so absolutely people should not think that gpt3 is the answer for natural language generation i i hope that right now there's so many different research groups in academia and industry that are just trying to think completely differently because if that's not the case i don't think we will make enough progress so now just to talk about gpt3 itself and like kind of the the whole gpt again sequel which i because i have any like the the story of it kind of goes with my uh, you know personal research line um so back in time this is like whatever like 2015 or so uh we had like suddenly all these new state of the art that was getting established in nlp for different like kind of tasks like the uh basically um i don't know part of speech tagging or name to recognition etc which were being enabled by like biolstm so suddenly it was such a big thing oh everyone should use biolstm but it actually wasn't working well for any common sense reasoning task so fast forward when the attention is all you need paper came out and the transformers and gpt1 actually one of the main models or kind of the main model that gpt1 was doing so well on was a story close test which is the task that i personally established as it was mentioning uh, so they basically got the state of the art by this sort of new large transformer model that they had um and with the very limited training fine tuning basically data set that we had provided which is like 1500 or so data points just tiny so that was kind of eye opening but it's still you would think that okay they're probably just picking up on the intricacies of the data set it's not true intelligence not true common sense reasoning it's not really connecting the dots uh, but fast forward so G- gpt3 came uh, you know when it came out in 2020 on the story close test they were getting like i think 83 or so percent uh, with just uh, without actually getting fine tuned right so zero shot few shot learning and that was pretty amazing right so for me personally to be on the you know kind of like watching it from the outside 
the fact that the story close test went from being a task that was extremely hard when we released it in, back in 2016, so the state of the art was like 63%. Then, of course, there were so many different models that were kind of trying to pick up and anchor on the intricacies of the particular test set. They were getting around 80 something percent. And then GPT-1 was doing even better than those. But we were still like, you know, scratching your heads, is it doing anything? GPT-3, right out of the box, had picked up enough common sense knowledge about the world that it could just pick and choose what is the right ending to a story without even being trained on any data, basically. And that's just pretty telling, right? I think we have made, uh, like, this is, this is progress. This is an amazing amount of progress. But as I was, uh, you know, mentioning in my comments on the glucose fork, uh, I think we should understand that we have to keep moving the goalposts. We have to keep, you know, holding ourselves up for even much, like higher grounds. And um, so, yeah, GPT-3 has been amazing in terms of the, the some of the capabilities it has, but it does make so many stupid mistakes, right? And I've, I'm sure your audience has read tons of them online. I don't need to talk about it. Even for, uh, so it does a good job right now, turns out, for picking their rights ending to a story, but when you prompt it to actually generate, if you go through a few of those, uh, like where you feed it like four sentences, basically of the very simplistic stories that I was saying, like more than half the time, it just spit out stupid things, right? So we don't have control, right? These models do not have control. These models make glaringly stupid mistakes, which I call them brittle for it, right? So it was a thing that people used to call old school AI systems, like symbolic AI systems, brittle. That was the adjective to make you like feel like hate them. But the truth is that our neural models are very brittle and that's, that's, that's something that needs to be fixed, right? So these are all lines of research that need to be sort of uh, developed further and further for next generations of the kinds of GPT model, which again, I hope it's not really GPT, but like where, you know, other kinds of things uh, for them to actually be truly useful and helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's a really nice perspective. I really like that. And mm -hmm. and and when we are talking about this different ideas, so there are uh, different ideas to solve a different problem. And I think that's what you said. Uh, that's what it makes uh, moving the goalposts is the uh, is the way forward. So you have been uh, fortunate enough, and you have you you're yourself a great researcher. And you have been fortunate enough to work with a lot of great researchers who have different intuitions, different ideas pitching in trying to solve a problem. So what do you think is kind of the uh, motivation for developing these ideas? I think uh, you said uh, you, you said yourself clearly, like even starting back from your high school, you have been application oriented, like trying to dodge the punishment mm -hmm. that you, you were given. Mm -hmm. And you had, a, you had an instinct of... Uh, I guess, resorting to research to kind of solve this problem. So I mm -hmm. think you, you might be an application-oriented person, but in terms of a much more broader perspective, what do you think that drives research in general? Is it, uh, or, or maybe I would say innovation in research. So is it is it a pure pursuit of research or the majority of the researchers are just application-oriented? They pick up a problem that they find interesting and they just work 24 cross 7 on those things? Or is it just something like, okay, I want to build the next bird kind of structure that is just from a very ground perspective or CNNs? Mm -hmm. uh, what really drives uh, other researchers, you would say? So I, I would say both, right? I think clearly both. And it's not just applied, I think, to our field being AI. In general, I think in science, right? Like how could you tell whether or not like I don't know, like the first Nobel Prize in physics was given to the guy that made, like that discovered basically the x-rays, right? And the way that he basically dis discovered it and like, which was kind of by accident, but the way he communicated to the outside world was through him having basically uh, scanned his wife's hand, right? And then people could see that, oh my God, like you can just, just you can see like, you know, go through the flesh and the bones are visible. My God, this is an application in med, you know, medical domain. And then all the doctors, of course, then crazy that, oh my God, we can now see inside our patients, etc. So it's hard to draw the line, right? I feel like many things come from theory. So he even like, let's say this is, this is given this physics story, he accidentally discovered something. And then by having uh, sort of broadcasted it, people found applications to it immediately. And without that, it would not, maybe would not have had gotten enough recognition, right? 
So I think it's the same in, in our AI world, right? It's just so hybrid. It's extremely hybrid, even in NLP. Uh, I think like back in time, maybe 50s or 60s, um, people started working in machine translation as a precursor to natural language processing because they wanted translation to happen, turns out. This is, I actually didn't know this, it just now occurred to me that my introduction to NLP was also true machine translation, but the reason I made that example is that way back, like many, many years ago, we met Tony Hoare, who has a, like a Turing award, and he was, just because I'm Iranian, he was just chatting with us, he was saying that, oh yeah, I went to Iran and back in time, oh, you work on and natural language processing. Uh, I worked on national, I started my career kind of trying to build a machine translation system for the government back in 50s, but I concluded that it's so hard that I realized I should just switch and work in theory of computer science. So it's it's completely hybrid, right? Always, there has always been there's a pull from like real world application and a push from the other side and our personal intellectual curiosity, basically, right? As to what, what drives us, I think, it, it has always been hybrid and will always be hybrid. And I hope that it stays that way and even more so than ever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a interesting way to look at. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and if uh, talking about what drives people, I think um, one of the key things that really stands out from your profile is your presence in the AI startup space. You have been uh, working on like moving out of academia and you have been working straight away into startup space, which is really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. So, can you like before before I get into details of those things? What was your motivation to consider uh, the messy, dirty startup space uh, moving <laughs> right out of academia? I mean, academia wasn't wasn't a short term. Like you did your PhD and going from academia directly into a, 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 a startup space. Why not take the normal research scientist job at a big name company, uh, but start off from a very scratchy version of your idea? <laughs> Good question. I honestly I actually really love that question because I, I want so many more PhD students to hear my story and hear how this whole line of career is actually not only viable, but also better, <laughs> but it's so subjective. So take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, because this is my personal journey, basically my personal experience. Um, so I kind of, so my motivation to want to do startups perhaps was my lack of motivation to, to join a big tech company, <laughs> I would say. Um, so towards the end of my PhD, I got pretty much disillusioned with the whole like reward system of just publishing papers for the sake of publishing papers, and um, which unfortunately is a part of academia, no matter what. And by academia, I mean, I, I always knew that I wanted to be in industry, setting be a fundamental research lab or like a startup like a deep tech research startup or a startup or now you know basically having my own startup uh, so i always knew that it would be in the industry but the choice between doing industry fundamental industry research lab and uh, basically startup was just about what gets me out of bed in the morning <laughs> to be honest with you so I spent like I was lucky enough that I could spend like a year and a half throughout my PhD in you know these big tech uh, research labs and the more I learned the more I realized that that reward system just doesn't drive me I could see that you know very accomplished super smart people who were just chasing citations and like trying to publish the more they can and put their names on this paper and that paper purely for the sake of that. And that's like, as bad as it sounds, it's just unfortunately a game you have to play, right? It's not that you have a choice now. It is for, you know, hiring for a company. I'm interviewing so many PhD students and so many research scientists in these big research labs. And honestly, I can just, it's, I don't know, maybe 20 times it has happened that I can remember in the recent history that people would tell me that, oh, let, I have to reschedule my interview now because now I have to find which paper I can submit to say NORIPS or NACL or ACL, the deadline is coming just because you have to, right? It's like publish or perish game. The other thing that made it kind of even more for me to get kind of wanted, wanting to detach myself necessarily from that being my 100% of my life uh, was this, you know, whole benchmarking craze that we had, the whole like let's beat the 
basically be on top of the leaderboard kind of a game, which of course also inherently I think is really not motivating for me personally, right? Just what's the point of making 1%, you know, yeah. increase yeah, in the accuracy, what would change in the world does it make? And to just make, you know, add some salt to that wound, you know, I'm an immigrant myself, we've been living here now for what, like around nine years, like miles and miles away from your parents, et cetera. And we work so hard and I'm like, why would I spend my life on doing that? Then I can probably make real world impact by doing the exact same thing, but not publishing and also just hopefully getting some better feedback, which is real users and not just a bench, you know, just meeting basically uh, people on leaderboards. So that just meant that I, I definitely wanted to work on something in the real world. And of course, I know this, this story that I'm t- telling is very subjective and research labs are also have like applied science. But in my personal experience, at the end of the day, no one still knows how to run hybrid research. And what happens at the end of the day is that there's still this resistance and there's this disconnect still that makes the transfer basically uh, of technology, whatever you call it, to product really uh, slow. And hence, re- startups where you're a tiny team, laser focused at a particular mission, which hopefully is grounded in a particular reality, which is a product, it is, the, is the way to go. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is really motivating, and I can relate to this uh, this uh, particular feeling of trying to be at your own pace. Because uh, over the time of your PhD, I'm sure you gain your expertise, and it really feels uh, suffocating to at least work at at a spa- at a place that could be limiting those things or maybe making it slow. And I can understand that uh, motivation of. Uh, venturing out into your own idea but itself even though this sound very glamorous that okay i, I want to do my own things i'm sure startup brings a lot of a lot of challenges that definitely at sometimes you might be thinking that i wished i didn't pursue this goal so can you talk more about the challenges that it brings uh-huh. versus i'm sure uh, we talked about the beauties that this particular idea or uh, direction of your career path brings so what were the initial challenges because from mm-hmm. when we move out of academia we are fairly immature i mean you had a you had a very pretty uh, industrious profile where you were working with microsoft and a few other companies that you had the idea of working in star, star I would say industry space. What were the outbursting challenges that you saw uh, that any student should know? Uh, absolutely. So yes, anything in life has ups and downs. And there, the, the truth is, as I said, it's just so personal, the choice, right? This very choice that I'm talking about, that it, it, it's even hard, right? To characterize like generally what are the downsides and upsides. For me personally, I honestly, since like I basically left uh, my previous job on 29th of February, 2020, like 13 days before the pandemic hit and the world (laughs) went upside down, who knew? But honestly, this probably, not probably, this definitely has been the most rewarding and most exciting time of my entire life, right? And I've been through so many different ups and downs, like good, good things, bad things. And this has definitely been the best part of it all. So the net of it is for me, like I honestly now you're, you're asking like what has been like a moment that I'm like, why am I doing this? It honestly has never happened. Although it should have, logical thing, it should have, but it didn't. Although despite all the hurdles. So there's so many, it's just so difficult, right? It's really not everyone's cup of tea. Like, as I mentioned, like I, when I basically left my previous job to start to co-found basically Vernick with my co-founder, Ahmed, we had all these grand plans of, well, we will do this and that. We raise our first round of financing this month. And then we hire the team in whatever month in 2020. And it all went like, uh, like everything had to be paused, right? The pandemic hit, like a global uh, pandemic and a financial recession. You had to put everything on the back burner and think about, okay, you're in a pause mode. What do we do now? <laughs> so these are all extremely stressful, right? This is not not easy by any stretch of imagination. But again, to me, it drives me. I have no idea like how else I would have felt motivated in life and happy in life if not for like really like managing and juggling all these things. Um, so yeah, it's, it's challenging. It's challenging. You don't have support that you start with being you and your co-founder. If you're lucky, actually, you have an amazing co-founder. You're very lucky. I'm extremely lucky in that sense. And then you basically uh, have to 
just put things together yourself. You have to deal with things yourself. You have to, like right now, for example, uh, well, now this is just getting into, you know, our own company, but like we raised our first round of financing a couple months ago. The, just the whole plan of doing that and closing it is extremely stressful, right? It's like not everyone's cup of tea and you have to do it all yourself before you can hire people to help you, to be your team, to, uh, and then you have to motivate them, et cetera. So it's, it's a roller coaster, right? I think that um, many people say it's like, this, this is such a cliche, but our favorite um, basically quote is from Reid Hoffman that says that, that doing startups is like jumping off an uh, airplane and like assembling the airplane, another airplane while you're doing it. Or I probably butchered that. But regardless, that's the idea, right? You have to, or he says, assemble a parachute while you're actually jumping, right? That makes more sense. But anyways, that's the idea. It's, it's chaotic. You don't have support. You don't have a program manager. A couple weeks ago, I was interviewing someone, like a researcher from one of these, like basically big tech company research labs. And they were saying that, oh, you don't have a program manager. I don't know how to live without a program manager. And I get it, right? I understand. It's it's hard to want to do everything yourself to put on different hats at different moments, or you don't have like software engineer dedicated to you for like whatever is scaling your model or deploying it. You have to do it all yourself. Uh, so they're def- they're, these are like definitely hardships. Again, not everyone's cup of tea. For me, it was perfect. It has been perfect. <laughs> Just somehow this is what drives me. But I can I know how this can be frustrating and infuriating. And of course, it's just startups at the end of the day. It's not your cushy job, right? It's not your nine to five job if you want to have like really, you know, strict like work hours and et cetera. So this, this, this is not it. Right. Right. And, and I'm sure you are in stealth mode. So even I haven't been, uh, I haven't had a chance to exactly look at what Vernik does, but uh, would you like to say a few words or maybe plug in what exactly you're working on? I mean, I wouldn't say what exactly you're working on, but can you talk more about Vernik in general? And if people are interested, how could they reach out to you about this uh, venture they're doing? So, yeah. Absolutely. Not exactly. What we are doing <laughs> is that, um, so Yes, we are in stealth mode. Not exactly what we are doing is that we are enabling anyone and everyone to make data informed decisions for their um, day to day work, for their business, for their personal matters, uh, without needing to have any technical background or any programming skill set. So we basically are innovating in the human machine interfaces area, which is obvious, like given me and my co founder's background. Like natural language is one such interface that we are thinking about, but we are really thinking much more broadly and multimodal. Uh, so yeah, we are in stealth mode, uh, but we have, you know, everyone can see all of our job posts online. Like we are hiring across the board. We are hiring uh, like full stack developers. We are hiring AI researchers. We are hiring ML engineers. We are hiring uh, data infrastructure engineers. So anything and everything within those lines. And we are trying our best, honestly, uh, to be mindful of just reviewing every application that we get and make sure that we have a basically a fair place and a diverse place. Um, so yeah, now we are like hoping we are seven people now. We are hoping to have like f- four or more people by the end of the year. It's an early stage of a startup. We are, oh, we are actually gonna move into our brand new office in Flatiron. In a couple days now, like less than a, yeah, in like about a week, which we are extremely excited about. Um, With the new New York, basically, we are also coming back, which is super fun. Um, So yeah, we are hiring. It's honestly the best time to to join us just because inherently the people that join now are going to be the core technical team. So there is tremendous growth and leadership opportunities. And as you can imagine, I'm personally a huge advocate of trying to get more women into AI scene, which literally starts from startups, right? Uh, the foundations of the big tech is when they were startups. And I, I, I hope that you know we can play a tiny, tiny role in changing the foundations of at least one such uh, tech company, if we can get bigger, of course, I want to have set up the foundations, right? So we would love to have as di- as many diverse people to apply so that we can have a diverse team from the get-go. 
yeah definitely definitely i'll be leaving uh, a link to your linkedin page and the one each linkedin page so that people can definitely have a look at what exactly it is and maybe potentially reach out to you and absolutely yeah, that, would, that would be really helpful and, and and trying to zoom out a little bit and just talking about an overall landscape of ai so you're working on this and and in the recent few years we have the the community has really highlighted the potential concerns about using AI. And it, like it has been in the only recent years that we have been looking at it at a different angle. In your, in your perspective, what do you think are one of the most potential concerns about uh, different research trajectories that people should know versus where are your hopes of like you, uh, concerns as in like something you would say that people should know what are the concerns and they should Precau like proceed with precaution versus where are your hopes that you think okay if this is th th this thing should really develop in the next five years because we badly need it or something like that so what has been your overarching uh, view on that um so concerns i think my concerns are probably not out of the line of everyone's concern which becomes boring of course so <laughs> just repeating like everybody we have extremely biases and this somehow gets even more has become more revealing with the recent advances and recent deployment of ai models uh, in into our real world right and these are major problems right i i i, I wish i had the right quite answer to this like many people now that i'm on this side that i'm on the decision making side right and i can basically uh, call the shots many people ask me okay so you're doing data informed decision making how do you mitigate bias how do you mitigate like misuses of the AI platform that you will be building. And when it's out there, how do you prevent the bad actors from using it for wrong use cases? And I'm like, I wish I had the right answer for this, right? And we are now small enough and we have, we have control enough that I can say it out loudly that, look, like we need regulations. Look, we need people, other people other than me and all the other tech, like kind of uh, whatever founders and executives, uh, to someone else to tell us what is the right and wrong. Why is it up to Facebook to to basically decide what is right or wrong? Who are they? They're no ones. Like who? What gives them the more you know the high ground like morality wise to want to basically make uh, make the calls? Uh, so I think that's a fundamental problem that we have, which gets into of course uh, policy making, gets into like you know societal uh, work, etc. Um, so my concern is that I, I wish I had an answer for it. I don't, and I think I shouldn't. I think the right people, policymakers, should should have answered to how we can basically control the applications of AI. I think it's the right thing to want to talk about, like talking about AI apocalypse. Apocalypse is the waste of our time, but talking about like jobs that are being replaced and talking about the uh, basically impact uh, and use cases of AI in every day to day live livelihood of people. That's that's major. We have to even invest more time. So in terms of hopes, I have. I mean, I'm, I I have high hopes for AI. I have I've been I've dedicated my life for it, so I don't know how to tell how else to sort of quantify it. Um, I, I, I'm extremely excited, like there is a reason why we founded Bernie in like 2020 before the pandemic, right before the pandemic hit and not earlier, just because AI is really matured, right? AI has definitely seen this uh, really recent line of advancements one after another that has enabled so many different applications that then the time is definitely ripe, right, for all of us to to think about uh, just taking them out of the you know lab settings very narrow inherently and thinking about generalization, abstractions, and uh, like domain generality in general. Um, so these are things that I'm extremely hopeful about. I'm excited. It's like I think AI can't couldn't be more exciting. And I'll add one thing is that. Um, I have had the tendency of doing whatever I've wanted and I've liked, and it's been pure luck that AI has become so hot, right? I probably right now maybe would have still worked on AI and the exact same thing that I've been doing, even if it wasn't hot. And then the question of what hopes you have could have, the answer to that could have been, oh, I hope that someday everyone would agree that this is such a cool area to work on. Um, but yeah, so I think I'm just generally extremely optimistic about the future that AI can bring and all the opportunities that it will create for, for everyday people. 
right yeah yeah that, that's a fair enough uh, fair enough uh, expectation so yeah yeah definitely and and since most of the people who are listening to these kind of podcasts are researchers or graduate researchers who are about to graduate or getting mm-hmm. into the re- uh, domain of research what to understand like most of the questions that i get personally uh, on uh, linkedin or other platforms is how do i decide doing a phd a lot of people are interested in into doing a phd but typically afraid of the four year five year commitment and publishing papers as you said is kind of a game that mm-hmm. everyone has to play so right. what was what was your motivation to do a phd was like why did you do it rather than doing some kind of other jobs that can help you do research anyways what was the reason that you chose phd back then uh, good question i think that my journey so i told you already so i definitely wanted to keep working on what i was working on like back in iran the textbook that was being taught for natural language understanding was from james allen who i applied to to work with so for me the idea was that oh my god i want to learn more about this this topic i want to become an expert in this whole area oh let's go work with a guy that has written the book and is famous for natural language understanding so that's kind of how it happened i honestly don't think i had any necess- like if somehow i could have worked with james uh, without becoming a phd student maybe i would have i have no idea but uh, i think to to be honest with you even when like younger uh, people ask me about okay should i do a phd in ai if i want to just learn more and like get a niche basically and establish myself my answer generally is still yes if you can just because ai is just um sort of making such uh tremendous progress that without being able to like read lots of papers without having time to kind of develop your own thesis uh you can get lost and i feel like phd program is really a great catalyzer for teaching you how to do research and how to basically think about uh different ideas and assess them right just as much as i don't like chasing papers and as much as i don't like chasing citations i i like the fact that occasionally you should have a f- good some good ideas and execute it in such a manner that your peers would give you a check right as again as random as our review processes could be at the end there are, there is some signal versus noise so i think there is some some um real value to that and even myself you know i just when i was talking with you about how much i wanted to to you know basically detach myself from that reward system i still i've i've published like three or so papers in the past a uh, couple of years so i ne- no longer played the game but i still like the idea of like the glucose right i've been working on that idea for many many years it was like stewing and then the time was ripe and i was in the you know with the group of right awesome people to want to execute it but i wanted to share it with the world i wanted people to build on top of it these are all great things that i think our you know research ai research community is enabling and getting a phd is a, a step right towards being a part of that community which again i think i agree it's such a long term commitment it's like 5 years over your life probably the best like years of your youth are being spent on your phd but at the end i think it gives you some muscles that you would not have necessarily been able to build without it yeah 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 i definitely agree and uh, definitely second you on that for decision of phd mm-hmm. so uh, definitely uh, uh, resonate those ideas very well so i hope uh, that's that's the case with me too and uh, one other question that i have is for a domain like nlp where the where domains like research who are not who are not supposed to be this much exponential mm-hmm. but in the last few years the research has been exponential so pick up any trajectory nlp has been growing uh, very fast so in terms of medical domains where they are dealing with emr data the research is growing at a very fast rate and in the standard uh, very mainstream nlp research is it's, it's also growing very fast for students who want to really grasp at this let's say when you want if they want to get started and get hold of a certain problem the resources and getting updated to the latest research mm-hmm. is kind of a problem it's it takes you few months to get updated to state of art and couple of months itself would have added a lot of weight to that so what was your to do's or best practices even when you are phd student and as of now to get yourself updated or tuned to the latest research how do you manage 
trying to uh, follow up your or keep yourself updated to these kind of developments in the mm-hmm. domain? Um, so I think actually, as you mentioned, things have kind of been growing exponentially. So back in 2012, when I started my PhD, probably we were moving at like snail pace, not compared to now where we are kind of flying. And the number of new papers that say come up on archive are, are just so much more. I mean, well, 2012, we didn't even have like AI for art. Like people didn't put their AI papers on archive anyways. So I think it's just a completely different beast that you have to keep up with these days. And the other thing that it has enabled is, of course, it enabled is, of course, sig- like noise versus signal, right? There's so, there's so much unfortunate, like low quality content out there. <laughs> like how do you? tease apart like noise from signal and know that you're spending your precious time on learning something that is truly valuable so i think that's kind of honestly like it's not easy Uh, i love reading groups i've advocated for reading groups in my entire life and we still do it like even now like we have so many different deadlines and so many different things well our reading group at bernie was going to be today but I canceled it because as much as like, I think Sam would be, you know, unhappy with this, but (laughs) um, we came because we were getting our vaccine right, right after this. So it was at that time, I was like, yay, a reason to cancel, but we're also super busy (laughs) moving into our office, but (laughs) no, no. But the, the truth is that um, I think like reading groups, for example, like trying to get into reading groups where someone else is trying to understand a paper that hopefully a group has chosen. That's one way of kind of vetting whether or not something's worth reading and just exposing yourself to as many such like a conversation it could be a reading group at your school. If you don't have one, start one. Again, I've done that for wherever I've been and I truly believe in doing it even when you don't have time, except today. I get a pass for today, right? Anyways, the, regardless of how many deadlines and things you have. The other um, thing, apart from reading groups, is I think these days, like there's so many, so much online content, which has made it so much easier to learn things, right? Back in time when I had to Google, all I could see in front of me was a Wikipedia page about what is national language understanding that there's these days there's tons and tons of tutorials right uh the only caveat is that as i mentioned nlp is moving at such a fast pace that like right now even like taking an online course on nlp which was curated say two three years ago may be partially outdated right like we probably don't even need to learn about lstms these days as as much as that sounds stupid uh, but it's just if you want to be a practitioner, you just don't need to necessarily know everything else that came before it. So I think hitting it that balance would be good, like trying to do reading groups and uh, learning about basically the most recent uh, pieces of work that are relevant to you somehow or your to, to your peers and someone else has vetted it at least. And every now and then it's you that has to vet and decide to tease apart that noise from signal. And also just, just there are so many tutorials online that I think are, are definitely helpful and you can just find, and all these podcasts, honestly, like I've, I've been doing these things for the past like couple of years and you have no idea how many people even outside our field would like randomly, right? See me somewhere or reach out and say, that, oh, I learned so much by this really easy to listen to and like intuitive conversation which would have been so hard to read a whole paper for it. So they think these, all these things, so thanks to people like yourself to, to spend time and effort into basically creating these kinds of content, this, this is really a good uh, way of absorbing information. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That totally makes sense. Um, that's what I have been personally doing to like podcasts. Like uh, a lot of people have been doing this kind of papers, summaries on podcasts. And that has been really helpful because when mm-hmm. I look back now in my schedule, reading papers is a big task. Like if you, if yes. you have some kind of and trying to take inspiration from different uh, researches, it is, is becomes tough. So, yeah, these kind of reading groups and podcasts definitely help. And yeah, I would just, uh, I won't hog up a lot of more, any more of your time, but uh, just was la- one last question that I like to ask. And because you have one of the key things about your profile is you have been a strong advocate of developing your own ideas from e- even if in, it's in research or in right now what you're doing at Wernick. So what would be a piece of advice that you would give to any kind of researchers or students who are aiming or or maybe just working within research domain, be it NLP, or if you want to take it to the uh, generalized version of version of AI, what would be one piece of advice that you would reflect back and say, 
please do this bosses please don't do this <sighs> this would really help i know that this is a very subjective question mm-hmm. but again feel free to take it anywhere absolutely so i think that if if an advice wants to like is to come from someone like myself it has to be about what i already said that you have to stay true to your own intuition and to your own interests right so we live in a very random world regardless and i think uh as i mentioned the, the dawn of deep learning that we are all uh, seeing the fruits of is due to a bunch of people really doing what they wanted to do regardless of the mainstream and i personally as i said i've been lucky that ai did get so hot or nlu get got so hot when i started my phd and i wanted to work on common sense reasoning no one cared about common sense reasoning everyone thought that so common sense reasoning used to be a thing in 80s and suddenly a thing from 2015 and i'm not even kidding if you look at the like the uh, basically um distribution of the papers that have been published suddenly in like mid 2000 whatever 15s <laughs> if that's a thing people started talking about it again because neural models were so bad at it that they were like oh maybe this is a problem we should all care about maybe this is a hard problem or in the next it's been even touted as the holy grail of ai by a bunch of people Thomas is reasoning me um so, so i i've been just doing what I've been, I've been doing what everyone would have said oh if that's a mistake right but I've been stayed true to myself and luckily now it's super hot everyone loves it everyone wants to talk to me about my my line of work because now they've gotten to their realization but if it, if it wasn't the case which has been for a good portion of uh, my life it's okay right again just you have one life that you're living just do what you think is the right thing you don't have to follow people right even my p- very decision uh for not you know uh, basically uh joining big tech like research labs was something that so many people have been questioning right but honestly my career could not have been better because i made that decision because i went against the ministry so that's just my one line of not one line how many lines was that so many <laughs> lines of advice the net of which is this one line that just stay true to yourself yeah 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 this is uh, this is one thing that really even i found uh, one thing that that's really sticks out your, from your profile is uh, <clears throat> developing and not 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 trying to be limited by the idea that okay even if the idea fails i at least had the word shot of at least trying so that is that is one thing that really stands mm-hmm. out from your profile and i hope people who are listening or seeing this podcast really gets that idea because i now feel kind of like even though i'm in my first year of psd i can see the kind of games you are talking about that people have to play and they play but at the end uh, it's it's once you get into the idea of research the genuineness and like you said sticking to your what you what you believe in really grows on to you and mm-hmm. i could see i could see the sense of what you have developed within your phd or academia life and it makes sense and builds a very st- strong stone for your idea and work nick and definitely i i wish all the luck for for your startup and this Thank was you. this was a really nice conversation i will definitely i definitely enjoyed uh, personally and i hope uh, people who find this interesting can reach out to you if they had any specific questions and but yeah thanks thanks for being here thank and, you thank you so much for having me and i hope a happy recovery of your second dose of vaccine <laughs> <laughs> i hope so i definitely can Take a day off, so hopefully we'll be fine. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Bye.